get some feedback from uh, you guys. What if you can quickly say your name and what institution you're from, and uh, quickly one question or uh, one sentence you can say about what do you want to get out of accessibility? So we can start from to my right here. Kevin Merritt from Lexmark International, and uh, here to learn in general. So we do have some accessibility uh, requirements that we have for our products. So I see. Everyone's being shy. Huh? <laughs> Everyone's being shy. <laughs> um, I'm Nicole Choi from Fast Korea. Okay. I'm working for Olympic Telecommunication Research Institute, which is a government funded research institute. So, and my major job is to research the market. Sorry about the noise that I was like. <laughs> So welcome everyone. Uh, today what I'm going to do is basically go over some of the accessibility uh, work which I've done uh, at MIT and what we were looking at is uh, how organizations approach accessibility, not just from a technology point of view, but also from a management perspective and see how they were able to uh, get it right and it's, it's not a uh, very simple thing to process and implement, but we've seen in, in this uh, side prepared four presentations and we'll see how time goes and uh, between each of the four set of presentations I will pause and we'll see if there are any set of questions. But feel free to jump in and ask any questions you have or anything uh, you want to more uh, clarification. So uh, first of all, uh, there's this term called, uh, I mean you must have definitely seen this uh, file on this kind of thing in, in every room but when such fire alarms were being built for the very first time, they mostly had only uh, audible sounds it used to make, you know. They were not making any flash sounds. So this, so the way it started was the company uh, which manufactures the, these fire alarms, sirens, they were making it so that people can hear it and just leave the building basically in case of emergency. But when they had a case where there was a deaf person in the room in the company and they wanted to make sure that they comply with the ADA requirements, ADA stands for American Disabilities Act. And in order to comply with that, they have to make sure that all these emergencies have to be uh, catered for everyone in the company. So what the company ended up doing is they ended up putting the flash uh, uh, lights so that the strobe lights go on when the emergency button is pressed. So now it became in fact a standard feature. So there are a lot of these technologies are out there which are first of all designed for the disabled and then you see the, that even everybody benefits from the same uh, kind of features. You know. So that's what we want to see is that by integrating usability uh, and accessibility there is more advantage in uh, reaching out to a wider population base. And we'll see. So 
this is first we will kind of go through here is uh, uh, what accessibility is and how it differentiates from usability and we'll go through some uh, examples and then it will be more clear and then we will st start the implementation process in the next uh, slide deck. So usability, I mean, as you know, it's a very generic term which is used that if a so when a, when a specific set of users can achieve certain goals uh, on using a product, uh, it's always in the benefit of the developer or designer to make sure they are able to reach that demographic what they're targeting and uh, to reach as many consumers as possible and of course to bring in the complete user experience for the uh, user group. So accessibility is not a whole, whole lot of different, but uh, uh, when you are looking at usability examples, uh, we know there's a TiVo voice recorder, uh, so it, it, it TiVo uh, video recorder. It enables you know, uh, people to you know use it as a when they are away or when they <coughs> program it ahead of time. It's much easier to use. You know how many of us remember using you know, uh, you know programs which are so complex, and that's what TiVo came about, came about so that they can enable such technologies which you know can make life easier, make a great ease of use case. You know. And there's another example you might have heard of is the, uh, the kitchen appliance makers, uh, kitchen, uh, a lot of the utensils and tools, they are made by this company, uh, Uoxo. And they, uh, their, their primary concern was because his, the guy who developed these tools initially, his wife was uh, not having good dexterity skills, you know. So he made sure that if you're using a can opener, you know, how can you make sure that it is, you know, you can easily hold it and do it, but now everybody benefits because these kind of tools are, you can see in every store and every all over the world. So it's not just focuses on products, but also in services and how you can make easier uh, the way you structure your product, the way you structure your service or your offering, and you offer to everyone as long as it solves the problem in the you know, ease of use case scenario. So I don't know how many of you have Zipcar. Uh, that's the model where you can rent car on an hourly basis and you can pick up the car. You don't have to go to a particular rental location, uh, but you can, it can be picked up at, at many parking lots, at, any, at many parking garages, at specific locations. And with the you know, advent of mobile and internet, of course, you know, this information is readily available and I can see on my mobile phone whether you know, where it's available or not. You know. So it becomes a lot easier. The whole business model changes. So accessibility is basically usability for uh, not just for the mainstream population, but also for the disability uh, population who have special needs, as well as some of the senior population who would like to uh, take advantage of those technologies. But it might be they might have found it difficult to use uh, such technologies from a normal product or regular <coughs> products what we see from the just for the mainstream population. So we see all these wheelchair ramps all over the uh, not just in the US but all over the world we see these ramps built in airports, uh, streets, and it not only benefits the wheelchair guys but it also uh, it benefits the people who are using you know uh, strollers, baby strollers, suitcases, rolling suitcases. Uh, people who deliver uh, packages by UPS, FedEx, they all have, can use, take advantage of that slopes going to the buildings, you know. So that becomes not an advantage, not just for the people who it's meant for initially, but it also benefits other populations. And that's a great benefit because, for example, if you have a consumer electronic device in your home, which not only works for you, but also for your grandfather or grandmother, you know, uh, it's great because you don't need to have two set of washers or dryers, uh, one for you and one for grandfather, grandmother. You can use the same set of appliances for everybody in the family, as long as that appliance can uh, flexibly meet the needs of everyone in the household. But of course, the manufacturers have to take that into consideration while designing that, okay, who are the target market? Are people living in multi-family home situations where they might need such uh, needs? For example, building bigger lobs or which give uh, 
audio and flash signals, for example, when the dryer is done or washing the cycle is done, so that a deaf person in the house knows that yeah, I need to attend to something. Uh, so, so those kind of things benefits everyone. So, of course, uh, when we were implementing within MIT, we were looking, of course, within the university structure, education, and a lot of you over here are today from universities, and I'm sure within your university departments or within the university uh, academic uh, administration, they might have a unit or a few people assigned where they take care of needs for the special uh, populations. So, it could be a blind person in the uh, as a student, as a staff member, or could be a deaf person, could be some skills who need special skills using dexterity or physical uh, needs they might have. So they might be assigned a special set of keyboards, a mouse. So those kind of things are very important. And in the U.S., the laws are uh, uh, have been around for since 1972, uh, and then again it was ratified in 1990. Uh, one, uh, the ADA Act, American with Disabilities Act, where they require that every educational institution, every uh, entity which receives federal or state funding has to provide uh, such and such uh, needs and make sure that all the populations are served. So laws are important. Uh, so as compared to usability as we have seen before, uh, as we have seen before that usability is for mainstream population where there are no set of rules or regulations you need to follow. But when it comes to accessibility, you have to make sure that you follow those regulations or you are making sure you follow the rules and regulations of that jurisdiction where it applies. So down the road we'll see that you know, there are regulations, different regulations all over the world. For example, in Canada there is, in the Ontario region, uh, they have this special rules and regulations. So any company or organization trying to sell or any product or service, they have to comply with those regulations. Uh, it's called the Ontario's uh, Disability Act. And they they are not just doing it like within two years, they have to implement everything, but it, they're doing it in phases so that companies can respond to the change. Uh, so for example, if a company like, let's say, IBM is trying to sell a software in that region, you have to make sure that the software complies. So just like the software which I'm using, this one uh, talks to me. This is a text-to-speech. Uh, so that's how it kind of talks. So, so they can build a lot of these, you know, uh, these technologies into the PCs or whatever software they're using. Uh, the fact is that a lot of the software don't work really very well. Uh, so there are workarounds it as well as every time a new version comes around, it doesn't work as uh, right. But, but at least most of the basic software work very well, and that's a beauty, and that's how I was able to do and do a lot of the reading and my assignments and everything else in the classroom. So, so it requires a lot of collaboration between various uh, parts of the organization. So, of course, as we see that usability and accessibility can be uh, different, uh, they can take different tracks, and uh, we need to make sure that they are able to, they will take advantage of uh, combining the uh, uh, processes within the company or organization so that they can implement uh, them. So, it does make sense to combine them, at the same time, when you, uh, uh, you need to appreciate the differences between the two uh, because accessibility can be very regulation based, usability doesn't have to be like that and uh, accessibility can require some special knowledge of products and technologies, uh, how to integrate them. But uh, as you know, I mean, today the focus is more on the user experience and that's why of course we have a great example They've been talking in this conference, and of course, Apple is in everybody's mind. And they built on user experience, and that's what they sell. They sell. They don't sell you product. They don't sell you service. They sell you experience. You know. 
So whether it's for uh, uh, mainstream population or specialized populations for disabled seniors, they are able to package it so that everybody can take advantage of. And uh, they are also winning in both the areas, just like in the mainstream. They also are catering to the uh, specialized population. We'll see later on, and I'll show you some example if time permits. So these are some of the ways by which you, know, you can uh, do the uh, collaboration uh, between usability and accessibility groups. So there has to be some kind of flow. So when the product development cycle starts, you need to build the requirements. Uh, you need to make sure that those requirements are set in uh, and the developers are aware of it. As well as uh, we need to educate the rest of the group, rest of the product development team and the marketing teams what we are trying to accomplish here, <coughs> what feature sets we are looking for, uh, and what user groups, what demographics we will be targeting also by incorporating those features. Uh, the key thing is, of course, you know, uh, the time pressures and the cost pressures uh, organizations and nowadays they run on. I mean, the consumer technologies have life cycles of six months or even less. Uh, I mean the product life cycle, so product development life cycle. So when you're developing a product, you need to get it out the door. I mean there's so much pressure, but we have to work within that and make sure those time scales are honored as well as uh, those features are uh, built into it. So of course, there are straightforward benefits from the, by combining all these ones and uh, by implementing it across the organization makes a lot of sense. But there's a lot of cultural change. It doesn't happen overnight, but it has to happen really uh, in a strategic way. <coughs> and of course, the leadership in the organization has to uh, make sure that they understand what, what they're trying to uh, accomplish. So these are some of the learning lessons learned uh, by implementing uh, accessibility initiatives. So there is always the fact that uh, uh, putting the requirements early into the project that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what happens is it's, it's a time consuming process. So we need to make sure that they all in the same page and uh, the expectations are set right in the upfront itself. And it's not easy to perceive, you know, uh, how uh, people with specialized uh, needs have, uh, how their need could be met. Uh, I've been blind only 10 years, you know. I, I used to drive, you know, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I used to go around, do all my errands, and uh, driving the car around. But uh, now I have to change my ways of doing things, you know. I, 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 do similar activities, except that I don't depend on cars. I use public transportation more, I depend on cabs more, but I have to rearrange my lifestyle so that I can uh, accomplish the same task. You know, uh, I have family, I have education, I, have, I need to run errands just like anybody else. We need to do grocery stores, we need to check what, uh, what stuff we need to get, we need to pay bills, we need to organize all that and do still, we all have 24 hours in a day. So we have to make sure that all these uh, services are met. At the same time, it's a it's a paradigm shift in how we approach uh, in, in doing it. You know. So previously, uh, of course, I used to depend on you know, a lot of paper material, books, and all those things. Thanks to technology, a lot of things are electronically available now. Uh, I can go on the internet. I can uh, get books in certain formats, which are very easy to navigate. Uh, yet there are some lot of material out there which is not readily accessible. So uh, it's a challenge, but we all have to uh, adapt to the changes as well as make the best use of technology. So what we are seeing in, uh, across the industry, not just in the electronic industry, but also other industries which it impacts, whether it's into the healthcare, whether it's into within the home networking, uh, I'm going to say the uh, uh, the, for example, the home security systems or thermostats, all these technologies, they directly impact on how it can be used by different
different people. What we are seeing is that unless there are these standards developed uh, properly, whether it's an industry initiative or a government initiative uh, program, uh, it's very difficult to achieve uh, uniformity across the board within the different product lines, with, with, with different product lines and services. Uh, but there, as soon as the market is, uh, market production is seen, that there are so many seniors out there uh, who are, uh, will be using this products and services, it will be very vital for all nations to respond to their population. So we have to make sure that uh, there are policy set forth, standards in place, as well as uh, the uh, developing platforms. So for example, uh, the iPod or the iPhone, they have built-in uh, feature you might have heard of called voiceover. So it essentially talks to me. So whatever, so let's say I have this iPod in front of me. So, so just a regular iPod, except the accessibility feature is turned on. So whenever I put my finger on, so these are the, uh, I'm going to go to the main. <coughs> so I'm just moving my thumb in the various parts of the. So there are these features where I can uh, activate <coughs> and uh, so as I'm moving my thumb over the various parts of the screen here, it's able to speak and tell me what, what icon I am on right now. So it, it makes these technologies available and any I device, I don't even have to uh, download a new app or anything, it's all built into the platform itself. So, so the power of platform is really the key, that if you build at the platform, such mainstream devices can work for anyone. And that's what uh, Apple has taken advantage of, and uh, they are also trying to address, of course, broaden their population and their reach. Uh, and of course, you know, with, with mobile and cloud computing, new types of applications are emerging but people who can take advantage of these platforms and technologies, they will be the winners. So these are just some of the key things which needs to be uh, uh, addressed when you're implementing accessibility. So leadership is important, as I said earlier, uh, the, the leadership should be committed in implementing it. Uh, the policy should be uh, implemented across the board, so everybody should be on board, whether it's the legal department, the uh, marketing, the engineering, uh, they all have to make sure they know what's going on. And of course, you know, uh, sometimes you have to uh, go to specialized uh, technologies or talk to experts. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of knowledge based on the internet, uh, which can be learned, or a lot of publications are out there, which can provide you a lot of information. So it of course becomes, you know, it embodies the whole user experience by combining both of them and uh, that's how you can achieve excellence. So I'm pretty much at the end of this slide. Uh, uh, I have three more slide decks, uh, relatively short, at the same time, does anybody have any questions or uh, can I focus on one area or the other more? I guess everything is good, so I'll keep going to the other one. What we were doing was uh, we um, uh, took on this project to study how Microsoft implements accessibility within their organization, and it's you'd be surprised it's relatively a it's relatively a new initiative for Microsoft, and we did this project for over a year uh, in studying how uh, Microsoft implements the uh, implements.
until it's accessibility across their company. Uh, and this is as recent as 2008, they try to uh, completely re overhaul their whole process because they were noticing that the accessibility uh, groups uh, were not being addressed to their products. And of course, everybody knows they make the Xbox, they make uh, a few, in fact, hardware devices also. And of course, they, they have more than 25 platforms. And they, I mean, we know, of course, the most popular one is Windows 7. Uh, but they are now into uh, the mobile also. And plus, they have you know, 20 plus platforms and 100 plus products. So they have to address this market. Uh, it is not easy for them. At the same time, it's a huge organization uh, bringing a change uh, after the requirements have been uh, designed for uh, only for mainstream population. It's, it's very hard to retrofit or you know, rewrite the software code. Uh, it's much easier, especially in case of software, to, to fix it or to retrofit uh, at the beginning stage then down in the product development cycle. So let's see how did Microsoft uh, did and this will be more clear how a traditional company like Microsoft approaches accessibility. There are some great lessons could be learned and at the same time there are uh, good things and bad things both from which came out of that which could be applied into the other projects. So this so this just shows that you know how the U.S. population or even the worldwide population how it's increasing uh, and how we need to address this population. I mean, this cannot be ignored uh, in the light of the fact that you know they are some of the highest uh, assets owner or they have the uh, cloud to uh, of marketing power. So. Microsoft worked in a very uh, cross-functional way. Uh, they have these various teams, but at the same time, uh, we were looking at from a more holistic point of view and try to analyze uh, not just from Microsoft, but we did studies with uh, Fidelity Investments, we did studies with uh, IBM, and few other educational institutions. So that gave us a good overview of how it should be approached. Uh, so this one just gives a kind of the linkage between the. various uh, characteristics of the processes as well as uh, what kind of qualities which are essential to implement uh, accessibility <coughs> and what, what are they achieving by having these processes in place, whether it's adaptive process, transparency process and by, by having these services offered to the uh, So when we are uh, looking into the products and services, uh, every product starts with an with a essential element and a commodity element. And when it is customized, we get to, into, a, into a next stage of uh, the product, which is uh, a service. And when you customize the service, you get experience. So for example, take a iPod, uh, uh, simple example, or uh, iPhone. I mean, by product it's just a physical device, essentially. Okay. Uh, but if I connect it with their app store, with all their offerings they have, uh, it, it becomes more like a service. You know? And then if you, are, of course, uh, customize it more, uh, the services, which is just meant for you specifically, you are able to manage your accounts, you are able to see your photographs and videos and do all sorts of things. It becomes, it brings new kind of experiences in your life. So, at every customization stage, uh, we achieve new levels of uh, value. So, from products, uh, you customize them, you get services. You customize services, you get experiences. And the next stage is, of course, when you customize services, you get transformations. So, that is more like uh, realization or transformation that, that uh, you know, being in the virtual reality or, you know, uh, various video games, they really bring transformation in how you think about uh, relationships, how you think in a more uh, 
non-physical uh, uh, non, non, non way in terms of uh, you can bring even spirituality into that picture. But the bottom line is that customization processes, uh, they can take it from products to services to uh, experiences and then transformations. So this is just a depiction of uh, what we were talking about, uh, how, the, how the various customization levels we achieve and then how it relates to those four transformation processes we talked about earlier. So this is how Microsoft was viewing their accessibility. Uh, so various companies approached differently. I'm not going to go into the minute details of what don't worry about if you cannot read the slides. Uh, there are a lot of details in there in terms of how the company should organize uh, at the same time. Different companies take different approaches. So for example, Microsoft uh, accessibility initiatives, they reside in the trustworthy computing group. Uh, which means, of course, security is of course important, but within that security framework, they have to implement accessibility so that it's readily implementable as well as security issues and security features are also honored well. Uh, different companies uh, do it differently. Uh, so, for example, IBM has their accessibility division more under a product development framework. So, they look from a quite different perspective. And there are companies, for example, uh, Amazon, they take it more from a legal framework, from more radiation uh, uh, type of framework that, okay, what does radiation require us to do? If it doesn't require, we don't probably have to bother, but if it requires, we will address it. So that's how they look at it, accessibility, and that's how they want to see initiated and develop the frameworks accordingly. So there are various ways by which you can So accessibility has various uh, phases just like any other development process, there is this versioning process, there is the pre-design phase, uh, so there are special attributes we have to follow uh, uh, along the other development items are happening. So in, in a typical software development or any technology development project, we have I would say four basic issues. Okay, uh, One is the security set of features which uh, the keynote speaker earlier they talked about a lot that how security is important and it it's a primary concern for most uh, users or the stakeholders. Then there is the uh, privacy concerns as a user, and not only as a user, but also as a implementer, whether you are within the organization, you, know, you have to worry about privacy issues uh, and data, uh, integrity, whether your data, data can be lost or data can be uh, compromised. So security, privacy, usability, and accessibility. So these four elements become the primary uh, drivers for the rest of the development process and how you balance these four so you can have, uh, you know, there, there, is, there has to be balance between security and privacy. So they go kind of hand in hand. Uh, similarly, usability and accessibility also go in hand in hand. So you have to balance the feature set so that you are able to provide a cost effective, a, in a timely manner, the whole development process to make sure that both these uh, issues are balanced. So whether it's a security privacy balance or the accessibility usability balance. So you have to address this and uh, uh, make sure that while implementing, you keep uh, all the groups in a fine balance. So this is just a typical uh, process of how the 
usability process implemented. So there were four groups, and in this one, so you can see that usability, and then there are four other uh, areas by which usability is literally needs to be implemented. Accessibility becomes a little bit more complex because accessibility involves a uh, few more stakeholders. So there are. So this is in terms of the beneficiary, uh, how the accessibility features uh, can benefit everybody. So accessibility is primarily of course meant only for disability and senior population, but as you expand your, uh, uh, your influence, your feature set is used by more and more bigger and bigger populations. So, the seniors also can benefit from the same features. So, for example, uh, you know, my let's say my grandmother may not be uh, hearing impaired completely, but she might be hard of hearing. So, if certain technologies can make the you know, volume go up, or I can have a separate connection to my speakers, it can it, it, it's versatile. So, it's very useful for her also. So, not only I benefit, but also the seniors will benefit. Similarly, let's say you are at an airport in. Uh, Frankfurt, Germany, uh, and you cannot read German anymore. But if the signs are there, proper icons are placed, everybody benefits. Everybody knows what the steps look like, uh, the graphic symbol of that, and that's how you find it. You know, that's how you can uh, uh, see and uh, benefit from just a simple symbolic representation. So. People with different cultures, people with different languages, they all can benefit from the same symbol, you know, what, what typically is used. And of course, everybody benefits, you know, uh, it makes faster and easier for everyone to uh, take advantage of. So, So this accessibility, uh, it's not just a within the enterprise. Uh, enterprises to look beyond that. We have to look into the regulations, uh, what groups you are trying to serve, and how you're going to go about doing your testing. How you going to do, do about whether your design is validated before you make 10,000 pieces or you know, uh, of your device. How can you make sure that it it, it, it fits the requirements? It, it meets the needs of let's say the 90 percentile or and the 80% you are publishing your targeting. So you have to do all those research as well as find out uh, which groups you are serving, get some feedback. And as you know, I mean, in, in software and hardware development processes, they can be very iterative and we of course use the agile development processes. We have to make sure at every cycle we address those issues and nothing gets uh, lost in this whole uh, iterative processes. Any questions? So this is how uh, IBM addressed the accessibility uh, and they had a more product development focus and it was more of a corporate initiative because they had various product lines and also IBM has transformed itself uh, into various um, into various types of you know, product lines. They were in the laptop business then they gave up that one also then they adjusted in services and they make systems, but ultimately, again coming back to the same equation, what we were talking about is companies, they sell the experience, whether they are selling experiences to B2B or B2C, but ultimately they have to deal with uh, humans who will be using these technologies. So these are typical processes which I'll kind of mostly uh, skip through quickly because these are, we can go into more details but in the interest of time we will I'll just show you briefly but if you need questions I will stop over. So we can very see at various frameworks how Microsoft was able to implement their uh, accessibility and what we developed is a, uh, a 11 element framework to look into the accessibility and how it's implemented. Uh, a 
I'm not going to go into too much details of it, but basically there are 11 elements which I will show you in the next slide deck, uh, how it's implemented. So, all these views are there, uh, 11 uh, element views, just to quickly tell you what is strategy, process, organization, product, uh, knowledge, information, uh, services, and uh, uh, ecosystem, and infrastructure. So all these uh, views, you, you have to look through the organization. I mean, typically, we are all familiar with the organization chart. So uh, we will be looking at two different lenses, basically. So this is how Microsoft organized uh, their uh, groups. So they had a chief accessibility officer who overlooked at all the accessibility initiatives and he reported directly to the CTO of the company. Uh, so they were trying to implement uh, accessibility across the uh, different products and platforms. And, it, and this is not happen overnight. I mean, this is, was a multi-year plan they were implementing, uh, which would implement over five to six years time frame. So even by the next to next product cycle comes around, then you will see those changes, and that that's not a tough, not an easy thing to do, because as we know, the um, the design cycles are much more complex. So we are using various analytical techniques to analyze, uh, and since I was in the system design management program, we had developed some system management techniques to analyze these processes, and uh, by using the quality elements, uh, we were able to uh, assign some of the uh, numbers to the each of the qualities and analyze uh, the implementability or the quality of the implementation. So we came up with various uh, models by which Microsoft should be looking at. Uh, so this was one of them, um, by how they can strengthen their accessibility area and by making sure there is more communication or there is more training of the accessibility specialist within the company. But of course, all the analysis reveal certain weak points and strong points, and that's what we have to look into that how it can be implemented. So these were just some of the system design management techniques we used uh, in these uh, slides. Um, so a lot of issues come up to the cultural mindset of the company itself. Uh, how the developers are trained. Uh, so let's say what we were recommending to Microsoft specifically and also to IBM is that how they should recommend uh, and train their developers and make it mandatory, not just make it a, uh, uh, that okay, they should comply with such and such, but making sure they are trained. So they develop some, a lot of the online training materials so they can do it at a leisure. Could be a, a one hour, test or something like that, a tutorial on accessibility which every developer has to go through in within a year. So all those programs were being developed and that was being very effective actually. So we had various architectures we were looking at how it can be implemented and we were just evaluating the various ways. But I will skip most of these ones and we will get to the part where uh, it's more uh, relevant for our discussion now. So. So we'll go to the third deck. So those are relatively small decks, what we will see now. So do we have any questions? So we will look at some uh, conservatory examples which in the recent what I've seen in the last few years. Uh, so this was one of the first uh, voice recorders, I would say, and this is just you know, 
three or four years ago when they released one of the first voice recorders which work for the blind. And I have it in front of me over here. Which I use it at the same time. All the voice recorders made before that by any company, whether the Sony, Olympus, they were not accessible. Accessible, what I mean is uh, the menus can talk. So it has a text-to-speech built-in uh, chip inside, which makes it work for the blind also. So I can change the menu, change the settings, I can navigate through different folders, so it will, it will talk to me. I mean, you might think this is such a no-brainer that uh, they have built-in speakers, uh, why can't they make this work? And of course their uh, volumes have shot up because a lot of the blind community uh, in the US and all over the world, they want such devices which really work. Uh, just for a perspective to give you a view, there are about one and a half million blind people in the US and there are about eight or nine million low vision people, so people who can maybe read bigger font size uh, or read in high contrast mode uh, which, which helps them but sometimes they are not able to read a lot of the regular material in the regular print format. So for them, uh, giving this audio feedback becomes very essential and it gets not only it confirms what they're reading, it reinforces their learning and they can easily migrate into using other modes of uh, communication with the device. So this was a, another a simple high uh, definition, not high definition, the SD radio introduced a uh, couple of years ago by Best Buy, actually last year itself. So this radio also has this text-to-speech features, uh, but they discontinued it, you know. Uh, I guess the volume did not come out, and also they got some, I, I, but uh, personally, I think this product was great, you know, the very well designed. But you see, the issue comes is you cannot meet everybody's single need. Everybody has uh, very specific needs. Everybody has their personal preferences. And there were some uh, bad reviews on the internet, which uh, I think kind of uh, blew it off. You know, and it did not really make sense for the company to, uh, they decided to, to discontinue the product. But I think it was a great product. It was a Typical mainstream radio, but there's a special feature which you can just turn it on and it, it, it talks all the menu items now. I can set the alarm clock without even looking at it. And of course, you know, uh, it has a built in speakers, it's a radio, so it just requires a little modification in the design process, but once it did it, it was quite successful uh, design product example. So, this is some of the recent ones. Uh, So this is a, uh, as you know, a lot of the seniors or you know, uh, great grandparents, grandparents, they sometimes forget to uh, take the medication. So there's a special bottle they have made, uh, and I'm not sure if they have an app release for it, but essentially you can program it, it can be, uh, every bottle will have its own identification, and it will, let's say for example, glow, uh, if that pill has to be taken by that senior. So these kind of technologies are there, and you see this is not just one physical device, this is also a service. And this is also providing a new kind of experience, you know, now the seniors or the uh, grandfather and grandmother in the house don't have to worry about whether they will forget to take this pill, or even the children don't have to keep calling them, okay, did you take your medication, you know, so this becomes an auto-reminder kind of thing where the body itself blows, okay, take me. <laughs> So this is uh, another So this was the thermostat which was developed uh, So this is also an example of how connected uh, these technologies have become uh, this is a thermostat in which anybody in the family can use it, uh, whether blind, uh, deaf, and also the good thing is uh, you can program these very easily, uh, put the program and uh, it essentially does a lot of the things which uh, you might 
think any device, any connected home device would do it. So those are the, some of the recent examples. And uh, the last slide that I have, which will be under 15, 20 minutes, which we hang around. So this is the framework which I was talking about that we have defined it um, to make sure how to address accessibility. So this one will give us a framework on how successfully you can start thinking from scratch and implement for accessibility. So we identified these 11 elements just like I don't know if you know uh, there's a company called McKinsey. They are one of the world's largest consulting firms. Uh, they have the 7S model, so, so it all starts with S. Uh, so that was implemented for, of course, for consulting and management areas. Uh, for technology development, we developed some uh, some models and frameworks at MIT. And so this is, we came up with, uh, and then trying to see if it can be further used by more and more companies. We already use this in three or four big corporations as well as in two or three smaller companies. So we divided these 11 elements into uh, essentially four categories. So for the first category is the core, which the strategy is the process, organization, products. So again, this uh, there are four categories, core, uh, category, and then the value creation, the value delivery, and uh, of course the state power. Uh, one. So we will see in uh, some subsequent slides and how it can be implemented successfully within the organization. So strategy in terms that first of all, of course, we need the a, have some frameworks uh, as well as a strategy with the organization that what we really try to achieve, you know, is it part of the mission of the company, is it part of the vision of the uh, leadership of the organization, and is everybody on the same board, uh, is all the groups uh, of different organizations within the company, for example, whether it's a legal department or product development organization, they all are aligned to achieve so, those goals. So that's very important. You, you have to make sure these processes within the company, they are uh, aligned along with the leadership's commitment. Uh, and then of course, you need to have these organizational capabilities the, uh, in the organization. So they are able to have these cross-functional teams who can collaborate and deliver the product and service or the experience, whatever they are trying to enter. Um, as you have seen before that in case of accessibility, you have to go beyond your enterprise, beyond your company to implement it because you need to uh, interface, interface with those uh, bodies which make the laws, regulations, as well as the the external organizations which will develop the standards and also interface with organizations which uh, will do the testing for your product or give you feedback on how your, how your product is being properly designed or not. So these are the three other elements uh, from the framework which will essentially make sure that your value is properly captured and created. So of course, what is your product? What is your what? What pain are you trying to really solve for your customer? Uh, and, and so, what are the key platforms which your uh, product is going to latch on? Whether it's those platforms are developed within the company, or whether they are other platforms from outside. So, for example, if you're trying to develop a wristband for uh, a so let's say a wake-up kind of device you are making, like they were talking in the morning. Uh, how much um, this device needs to take advantage of already the built-in features of a iPod, iPhone, iOS operating system. So that those decisions have to be made and you have to define your product around it so you can, of course, uh, deliver the experience what you are intending to do. 
then you need to create the knowledge uh, within the company, uh, what technologies you need to know about the budgets, about the IS features, uh, can you uh, get a patent on it, can you uh, leverage off of it and make sure you retain the employees who have that knowledge as well as uh, make sure you build a competitive edge so that you can sell it to the marketplace. When there are so many apps, so many devices out there. Uh, just this year in CES, we had more than 500 products which were uh, essentially just meant for uh, in the home health arena. Uh, how do you make sure that, that those devices are meeting these requirements and, uh, and, and all the seniors and disabled are able to take advantage of this technology? And of course, you know, how you organize information. You know. As you know, I mean, we, those days are gone when we uh, all used to, all the employees of the company have to be in the same building every single day to make sure communication and development and all these processes, business processes happen. Now, of course, you know, uh, everybody is connected. How does the information flow within the company? Uh, how do we collaborate? Uh, as well as, we need to look at from an information viewpoint that how information flows within different groups of the companies, whether it's cross-functional teams or whether it's dedicated teams which are doing the development process. Now we see how the uh, value delivery elements are, uh, take advantage of implementing accessibility. So we need to look at the infrastructure view, which look into the uh, how much interest will we need? I mean, do we need to contract this out or do we need to develop this in-house capability? All these decisions have to be made, uh, whether we need to uh, you know, buy special devices or for testing it or whether we can outsource them. So those decisions have to be made and if the company decides to develop that infrastructure, we have to scope that and of course uh, be ready to scale if need be. Then there is a service and experiences. So this is very similar to products, except you know uh, you create value by enhancing your products. You get services by enhancing your service. You get experiences. So you have to make sure that you are able to offer end-to-end -end solution for the customer, uh, for the implementer, as well as for people who are maintaining. So for example, remember we talked, uh, we saw that glow bottle, a uh, pill bottle. How does that pill bottle uh, needs to be programmed? Does it need to be programmed by a user themselves or their care provider has to do that? Uh, how do you mitigate things such as if things go wrong or if they forget to take a pill or the battery went dead? How to mitigate those issues? They become more challenging in fact just to serve how your product can fail in a service situation or in a, uh, when, when it's being used in a particular environment. Then if you understand the uh, ecosystem, what kind of risk, uh, risk you're taking, so who is responsible if the model doesn't glow, if the model doesn't glow? Is it the provider uh, or is it the uh, bottle maker? Uh, these, are, these can have some serious consequences, so we have to be aware of uh, these risks as well as make sure they are addressed you know, by in the design phase itself. Then there are these, you know, few elements which are very important. If these are taken care of, you can ensure that your product uh, will live longer than intended. You know. So every product has to have a uh, birth, a maturity level, and then of course it has to die. The new technologies will keep on coming. Uh, your product will not live forever. Your service will not live forever. So we have to make sure that there are things in place and you keep your eyes and ears open on what's happening in the competitive world as well as in, in policies, regulations uh, and in the external environments uh, whether it's the political environment, uh, the technologies so those things you have to take care of and you have to keep a open uh, communication channels to those uh, different stakeholders where these standards are being developed be aware of the consumer groups and uh, see that these standards are being developed. Uh, so for example, uh, the HTML code, it is not dictated by any law or regulation that you have to follow the HTML code, HTML5, HTML4.01. Uh, 
there are recommendations. So, for example, there is this body called W3C, the Worldwide uh, Web Consortium. It's actually resides within the MIT campus. Uh, and Tim Berners Lee, the inventor of the internet, he is one of the directors there. And they have developed this organization, uh, the W3C organization, so that uh, they can coordinate with various organizations all over the world and make sure it is, uh, it is, they are addressing the development of standards, not just for the mainstream population, but also for the uh, disability disability. So that's pretty much I had, and then uh, there are some key recommendations which kind of comes from all the research we did. So of course every case has to be dealt on a case by case basis, every product service company uh, yeah, is different, so we have to look into finding what, what really contains. We have to have make sure that there's committed leadership, and where does the key uh, initiative reside, whether it's a legal department or is it the development organization or is it the uh, uh, trustworthy computing or something like that. The most important things are of course you have to make sure that accessibility is uh, part of these specifications. Uh, it should be uh, developed and put for at the beginning stages of the development process as opposed to uh, at the latest time when it's too expensive to retrofit or to make any changes down the road. And of course, you've got to take advantage of the platforms and uh, you know make sure your product lives as long as the platforms are out there and take advantage of the technologies. Thank you. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so that's what you have to build in the service of product, whatever you're offering. It should be part of the design process. So for example, a pill bottle, okay, how can you make sure that a senior person has taken that pill or not? Uh, just think for a minute and so if you, let's say, have a feedback loop from the senior person, so they have to, let's say, either the, if the bottle was not picked up or shaken or there was no confirmation sent to the internet website, a phone will ring automatically. Maybe that, okay, uh, your battery is dead or something, you need to take your pill. But there needs to be a, uh, so this could be a more like a cloud solution, right? So there could be a, 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 a main a service provided by a company or by, uh, could be an app by which the reminder, if the, is the reminder from the pill bottle to the, to the iPod device, uh, to the cloud, doesn't reach within 15 minutes of the medication time, it automatically sends a phone ring, let's say, to the relative and maybe the senior person. So you need to think of a some creative ways, but to manage risk and to manage uh, these uh, uh, inadvent uh, events. So that's part of the design process. That's what thinking you have to do at the beginning stages of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, these uh, designs of products and services. Because once you already built a device, and then you're thinking about, oh, how can we adjust this, right? too late in the design process. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you so much. Uh, we are winding down, but thank you for coming.